Good morning and blessings to you all. Um, this truly is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Um, to our church family, our friends, and our visitors, we want to thank you for joining us virtually this morning. Our prayer and our hope is that you are blessed through something that is said or through a song. Um, let us read the word. Um, I'll be reading from Psalms 100. And the word reads, Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. Yes. Serve the Lord with gladness. Yes. Come before him with joyful songs. Yes. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. Yes. His people, yes. the sheep of his pasture. Yes. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Yes. Give thanks to him and bless his holy name. Yes. For the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever. Yes. His faithfulness through all generations. Amen. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father God, we come unto you this morning um, into your courts with a heart of praise and thanksgiving upon our lips. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for waking us up and touching us this morning, Heavenly Father God. We thank you for getting us through this week, Heavenly Father God. We thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, seen and unseen, Heavenly Father God. And right now, Heavenly Father God, we uplift this service, Lord, that you'll just have your hands upon it, Lord, that you will have your Holy Spirit uh, consume us and control this service, God, that somebody may be blessed. Lord, we just pray right now, Lord, for anyone who may be dealing with something this morning, Lord, whether it's financial, whether it's spiritual, whether it's physical, Heavenly Father God, we ask that you be a provider, we ask that you be peace in the mind, and we ask that you be a healer this morning, Heavenly Father God, and we just want to uplift those who, who are uh, teaching, Lord, and for those who will be going back into the schools, Heavenly Father God, that you just put a special blessing and covering all of them, Heavenly Father God, as we journey into the unknown, Lord, and doing school virtually, and doing things that we have been done before, God, but nevertheless, you are a God who is in control, you are a God who knows everything, you are a God who provides and gives us the answers to the things that we need, God. We just pray that you continue to uplift us and to strengthen us and to build us to be who you call us to be, Heavenly Father, God, and it's in your mighty matchless Son, Jesus' name we pray, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise, hallelujah, and amen. 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 We now have a song by our music ministry.
God today. And we know that God is awesome in our own unique and individual ways. Uh, if you have not yet come to know this God whom we know is awesome, we're thankful that God has an awesome word. An awesome word that will call you out of darkness into the marvelous light. So we want to thank you certainly for this opportunity to preach uh, the word of God today. And I want to call you uh, 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. 2 Chronicles, uh, the 20th chapter. And I would then, uh, I would begin reading with verse 15. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus the Lord saith unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them, and behold, they will come up the cliff of Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook, before the wilderness of Jerusalem. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed, for tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites, the children of the Kohathites, and the children of the Korhites, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel, who stood on high. I want to talk about battle lessons. I want to talk about battle lessons on today. Listen. Uh, from a military and from a strategic standpoint, uh, it's important to learn some takeaways after a battle. Uh, after a battle, military strategists want to assess performance. They want to see what worked, what didn't work, and how they can improve for the better. Uh, the reason being because no matter whether they won or lost the battle, they are not naive enough to assume nor believe that it will be the last battle. In fact, one of the reasons why you need to assess uh, the battles that you've been through, whether it be victory or defeat, is because another battle is on the horizon. And you and I need to understand that if we've been through a battle, if we've been through a storm, we need to get some takeaways there, some things we need to learn in order that we might be better for the next round of battle. Listen, the text reminds us that we have to be honest about our context. Uh, we cannot hide the fact that uh, the children of Israel under King Jehoshaphat, uh, their context was that they were in a battle. But also you need to understand not only must we be honest about our context, we must be very sure about our contact. What I mean by that is your context can always be taken care of by the one in whom you are in contact with. So the lesson is tailored to teach us that we can have confidence in a crisis. We can have confidence in a crisis because we don't have confidence in ourselves, but we have confidence, listen, in God. You'll notice in verse 1 and 2 of 2 Chronicles chapter 20 that there was a very grave intelligence report. A report had come to the children of Israel that there was a vast army uh, that was hunkered down, that was lying in wait and ready to attack and overtake the children of Israel. Listen, and you got to listen to the intelligence report, but understand there is someone who is omniscient and who knows more than the report that you and I may be receiving. It's important to get some takeaways from the battles that we go through, especially when we are up against the impossible like the children of Israel. When we are between doubt and desperation, but I want you to understand something. Sometimes you can see more through your tears than you can through a telescope. That's why the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. And so don't worry about the fact that 
you are crying in your battle and you cannot see where you are going because of the tears in your eyes. Faith says you can see more in your tears than you can see through a telescope. Because in your tears, you are at a point of desperation. And when you are desperate, you are right at the point where God can step in and do whatever you need done in your life. Robert Mary McShane said this, that the darkest hour makes Jesus bright. Crisis moments are defining moments that either make us or break us and they reveal who and where we place our trust. I just want to ask you a question today. In your crisis moments, where do you place your trust? Whenever you are in a battle, where do you place your trust? We find the children of Israel have gotten a bad report and we've got to be like them and place our trust in the Lord. As we begin to analyze the text, I want you to understand something. That battle lessons, first of all, begin with understanding that victory is in the details. And so we look at the details of the text. We're going to look at battle lessons on three phases. We're going to look before the battle, during the battle, and after the battle. Before the battle, we realized they had received a very negative report. Going back to verse 1 and 2, that there was a vast army. Listen, I said be honest about your context, but listen, put more trust in the one in whom you are in contact with because it does not matter what the report as long as you've got a greater report. It doesn't matter how many enemies you are facing as long as you are on the Lord's side because the Bible says greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Before the battle, understand that God always purposes to bring us the best kind of deliverance. And what you and I must understand is sometimes God brings a speedy response to our cry. But there are other times when God does not bring a speedy response, but he starts the train or the chain of events to bring about our deliverance. And so while you are waiting on God, don't stop trusting God. Don't uh, doubt God. Don't allow your desperation to give up on God, but realize if he didn't bring an immediate deliverance, the chain of events are in motion to bring about your deliverance. Somebody talk to me in this place. And what we learn in verse 15, we learn in verse 15 that we need not be affected by the mere magnitude of our problem. He says, listen, uh, don't be concerned about the vast array of people that you see because the battle is not yours, it belongs to the Lord. Listen, we need not be concerned about the magnitude, about the size, about the quantity of our predicament because God is greater than what we are going through. Listen, we often overestimate numbers. It is a mistake to assume that we are safe because we are in large numbers. Matter of fact, large numbers can bring overconfidence, carelessness, and negligence. Listen, we need to understand that God is not concerned about quantity, but quality. Not size, but spirit. It is this that decides today. Ask Gideon. Gideon uh, was leading uh, the children of Israel during the period of the judges when the Midianites were attacking them. And look what God did. Gideon went out to battle or started battle with 32,000 soldiers. And the Lord told Gideon, wait a minute, you can't go with the 32,000 because if you win with the 32,000, you won't take credit for yourself instead of giving glory to God. And so he whittled 22,000 away got it down to 10,000 and said, no, I'll give you 10,000 is still too many because you're going to give glory to yourself and not to me. So I'm going to whittle it down to 300 where you are really outnumbered. So you realize that the magnitude of the number you face ain't got nothing to do with the magnitude of the God that we serve. But then during the battle, we need to understand that we must be armed the holy trust in God. God tells the children of Israel that you've got to meet your enemies, listen, uh, not with carnal weapons, but with a joyful heart and tuneful lips. Uh, the children of Israel under King Jehoshaphat, uh, they met uh, their enemy, not with swords and spears, but with joyful hearts and tuneful lips. Listen, 
you got to learn how to praise God uh, in the midst of your battle because your praise is greater than their weapon. Y'all not going to pray with me here in this place. If you'll simply magnify God in the valley, magnify God in your tears, magnify God in your sickness, magnify God in your problem, you'll realize, wait a minute, the battle really is not mine, the battle belongs to the Lord. I don't know why I'm staying up at night, I don't know why I'm having sleepless and restless nights, because God was good to me before, and God will sure enough be good to me today. Listen, when you show up in the battle, with joyful hearts and tuneful lips, you'll realize that your joyful hearts and tuneful lips are not unwarranted, but the event justifies your hopes. Listen, if you'll look at verse 23, you'll notice something very interesting that you and I will discover in the battle. Uh, verse 23 uh, says that, that the Ammonites and Moabites turned against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. The Ammonites and Moabites turned against the inhabitants of Mount Seir and completely annihilated them. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy each other. Y'all miss that. It does not say that the enemies who were coming against Israel started attacking Israel. It says that because the nation of Israel started praising God, those who are aligned to defeat them started fighting amongst themselves and wound up annihilating themselves. Y'all not paying attention. The Bible says that the Moabites and the Ammonites and those from Mount Seir had made an alliance to come against the children of Israel. The children of Israel started praising God and the enemy that wanted to attack them, they started devouring themselves. The good news is this. Sometimes you ought to just leave your enemies well enough alone let God, let God fight your battle because they will dispense with each other. Listen, Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And Sambalat and Tobiah and Gershom came to Nehemiah and said, Nehemiah, we need you to come down. Nehemiah said, I can't come down. Why should the work cease? While I come down to you, sometimes you got to leave your enemy well enough alone and understand that under God's hand, the evil that we fear is offset by the good God who is on our side. But then after the battle, we see in verse 27 and 28, there was a jubilant procession to the sanctuary of God. Because the children of Israel realized in verse 29 that the cause of God is greater than our plight. What does this mean? This means, listen, that the intricate details of our life are not what's important. It's the grand purpose of God over our life and over this world. And the intricate details of our life are just a part of God's overall plan to glorify himself on the earth. That's why God will allow you to get victory without throwing a blow. Just like the children of Israel, God will give you victory and you ain't even got to throw a blow. Dr. Vance Havner says this, Jesus is all we have. He is all we need and all we want. And so therefore, we are shipwrecked on God. And we are stranded on omnipotence. We are shipwrecked on God, stranded on omnipotence. Jehoshaphat reached that point of human extremity, which is God's opportunity. Our point of holy desperation is an opportunity, my brothers and sisters, for God to do what only God can do. And so we are reminded in the text that we can have assurance in adversity. In fact, we can have holy assurance that Jesus is ours. It does not matter the context. If you have a holy assurance in your adversity uh, that Jesus is yours, then you've got the right context. Listen, we often say don't wait till the battle is over. Shout right now. But uh, the reason why you can shout before the battle is over is because God says you can shout on credit. And the reason why we can shout on credit is because we know God is good for it. Y'all ought to pray to me here in this place. We can shout on credit because we know God is good. We know God is merciful. We know God has a record. God has records. And come here, Jacob and Jacob met that Shabbat. We find that God had a record of delivering Jacob. Come here, Moses. When God met Moses and the children of Israel, 
deliver. You don't have to wait till the battle is over. You can shout right now. Because someone's credit is only as good as their references. And I believe I got some references here today. You can say that God is good. That you can shout in the midst of this battle. Because God brought you through. And God will bring you through it again. Learn lessons from your battle. Not only is God good, but God's greatest reference is Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you and I. And as he died on the cross for you and I, we need to understand something. At the cross, our credit was simply no good. Listen, our blood and our righteousness was declined. But Jesus had already paid the tag before we presented our card of righteousness. And guess what? He's got not just a maximum limit, he's got an unlimited limit. And his blood still works. And his blood will deliver and save you. So come to him today and let us know that you've given your heart to Christ. God bless.